Live and in living color. And I couldn't open up a can of whoop-ass by myself. So my very special guest tonight is none other than WWE diva, Paige. That's me. Paige, Hi. welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's really weird being here, though. Hard-fought win on Monday Night Raw tonight. How are you feeling right now? Obviously, you got the big win. Are you nervous about the podcast? Are you excited about the podcast? I'm, I'm freaking out about the podcast. <laughs> like, this is like this is awesome because I get to talk to you. And like I had to like rush straight from a match. I'm a little bit sway, so I'm a small little bit. But that's why I'm like quite far back. Let's talk about the match a little bit. How do you feel about it? Um, I thought, you know, it was it was it was cool. I I'm every time like I'm in there though, I'm a, like my biggest critique, like critic. So every time I'm like doing something, I was like, oh damn, I should have done this, or oh damn, I should have done that. So. But you do that in the moment because like when I would yeah. go back and watch, then I would nitpick stuff. But you know, <laughs> while I'm doing it, I wouldn't think about it so much. Are you no. good about watching now and being harsh on yourself? I can't watch back, but once I'm in the ring, then I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, I completely messed that one up. Yeah. Now we were talking before we went on the air, and this should be an unleash show because. You talk a lot like I do on my explicit content show. You cuss a lot. So are yeah. you doing that in the ring? Uh, yeah, I do do it in the ring. So if, like, a girl catches me or, like, or whatever, like, I'll drop, like, an F-bomb and I have to try not to. And then I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to have a go at you. It's just, like, my... This so they think you're mad at them. Yeah, they think I'm mad at them. Are, like, you, are you just harsh on yourself? I'm harsh on myself. But, like, I'm, I, I have to calm down. Like, I get told all the time, like, Paige, you have to stop cussing. It's not ladylike. It sounds trashy. And I'm like... Well, but it works for it works for this business. Yeah, I mean, not outside it. Probably, I should probably calm down on that. You know, I you know, I found out uh, you know you were going to be on a podcast. And I was like, man, I'm really excited to talk to Paige because you have a very interesting story, and you're only 23 years old, uh, but you've been in the wrestling business for 10 years. You've been in the ring for 10 years, mm -hmm. and literally born in the business. I, yeah. Your mother was taking bumps when you were still, you know, well, she was seven months pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> look so at that you, bad boy. Ugh. How many times, I, I can't, I can't, well, I've never talked to a 10-year veteran who was only 23 years of age. Wow. And so people were talking to me about the podcast, we love Paige, but she really hadn't been around that long. Yeah. Yes, you have. Yes, I have, guys. <laughs> yes, I have. I want to go back to your story and uh, talk about how you got into the business because your dad, Ricky Knight, yep. and your mother, Soraya, yep. I mean, have been in the wrestling business forever. Mm -hmm. And so talk about that. I know you've told this story a few times, but just kind of yeah. bring us up to speed on uh, the, the, the WWE universe, up to speed on how you got into the business because it's a lifetime thing for yeah. you. Yeah, so my whole family wrestlers, obviously, my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sister was a wrestler. There's my mom and dad, ooh, gorgeous. And then uh, my granddad was a referee, my uncle was a wrestler, my nieces and nephews are now becoming wrestlers. You know, it's just like a family business like my, my dad has his own company but yeah I growing up I was completely petrified and scared of wrestling like all together like it was it scared me because I grew up and I saw the injuries that, that these guys had to you know and I didn't get to see them very often because they were away all the time so I was just like oh no I can't, I can't step in the wrestling ring I watched it all the time like old school were English. you afraid of the, the, the perceived violence yeah of right. course yeah, but my mom was blinded for six months from wrestling you know what i mean like it what happened she got drop kicked in the eye from the top rope by this lady called julie star and like it so she, that swelled up so much that then it got infected went to the other eye and for six months she just couldn't see so my dad had cooked for her i was cooking for her and I, I was like super young i was like under 10 years old and i'm trying to cook this dinner for my mom because she's so sick and then my dad wasn't wasn't there because he was like wrestling and right stuff, you know so there's so many pictures on there, man. I'm looking fresh as a daisy. Wow. What does that do for you when, you're, when your mother has actually lost sight from a wrestling match? I, obviously, I, I would be petrified from the oh, business. it petrified me. And I was always one of those kids as well that would be beside the ring crying my eyes out, trying to get in the ring. Like, no, leave my mom alone. And my granddad, he was a referee, and he still thought, like, you know, he would get into it. He'd start taking a shirt off, and he'd be like, Ugh, like, storm, storm about the ring. And I'm like, granddad, you're the referee. You need to chill out, you know. But your mother and father working in the business, uh, and... Yeah. Did they ever smarten you up and say, you know, hey, Well, Paige. not when I was younger. They, they, were, they you know, they, they try and, you know, kept me away from that kind of right. thing. For You know, they, they wanted me to grow up to think that. But, um, yeah, at one point, obviously, I grew up and realized, like, okay, like, I know what this is. And um, I did a little bit of training with the family because my dad owns a training school, too. And me and my brother, actually, Zach, which is the one in the top corner with the hat on, He's 14 months older than me. He, me and him would go in there and we'd do this thing called the Rob Van Dam Spa. And we'd like be running. And, um, and my dad was like shorting a girl one day for one of the matches. And he was just like, hey, Raya, do you want to get in there? And I'm just like, are you serious? Like, I can't get in there. But I did. And like, I was completely hooked, got knocked out. It was great on my first How'd match. How'd you get knocked out? I got, 
I can't remember. Right. I cannot remember. It was something, and then I think it was up my bump, and I didn't tuck my chin. And like I, I knocked my head, and all I can remember is just staring up at the ceiling, like, oh, I love this. This is great. I want to do this forever. You know, it was wild. But yeah, from then on, I was like, no, I know what I want to do. And you know, growing up with my brothers, especially Zach, who is so obsessed with with the WWE, he used to we used to watch the videos, and we used to have the the, the little Titan Trons and the action figures, and. I was like, man, I want to be like the divas. Like, I want to be like Leah. I want to be like Bull McConnor. I want to be like Alundra Blaze. Like, I want to be like these women. And they were amazing athletes, and they were awesome. And I was just like, I want to be there one day. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to, like, send out my resumes by the time I was 13. Send them out everywhere. My mom helped me write them. Well, okay, but let's go back to your training. I mean, yeah. Because was it basically your mother in the ring training with you? <clears throat> Did your dad chip in? And, and obviously second generation, some people just kind of through osmosis or just the fact that they're around the business so much they pick it up. Yeah. M me, myself, going through the, the school, I was a slow learner. Me I too. was hard. For, I was aggressive, but hard to learn. Yeah. How was it for you? Well, it was hard, especially the selling part, because obviously before I was 13, I haven't been in a real fist fight before, so I didn't know how to like the way to move my body around and stuff. So like it would be my parents and mostly my brother, Zach, Zach, Zach and Roy. And the way they taught me how to sell, they would stand me in the middle of the ring. They, they'd say like, okay, so we want you to close your eyes and then we're gonna hit you. Like, but not too hard, but to the point where you're just like, oh, and then it taught you how to, how to right. sell properly. But yeah, they would do that for a good 15 minutes where like I'd have to close my eyes and I wouldn't know where it was coming from. I'd hear, boom, my mom would slap me in the face and I'm like, ah, like I'm 13, this is, this is borderline, you know. This isn't good. This isn't good. But you were able to put two and two together and yeah, come up with and the it concept. Helped. Yeah, it definitely helped. But yeah, they, especially when I had matches with them too. When I had matches, people thought, oh, they're going to hold back because they're her um, No, they beat, the, they beat the living sea at me, you know what I mean? My dad's a big guy, and he did this thing where he, like, sits on people. Right. So I was, like, lying on the floor, and he, like, runs and jumps and, like, sits on my chest, and everyone in the crowd is just like, oh, my gosh. And I'm, like, 13, like, with my big, big old dad sitting on me. But how was uh, how was that growing up? Because I mean, because basically you started bumping, taking you know training uh, in the ring at about 12 to 13 years of age, well, correct? I've technically been bumping since I was a fetus because my mom was actually wrestling with me. And Ro Robbie Brookside actually, he's down in NXT. He gave me my first yep. bump. And I said this on the other podcast too, but he gorilla pressed my mom when she was seven months pregnant. She's a small lady, so like you just couldn't tell. Right. And it's 14 months before she just had Zach. So she gorilla pressed, uh, he gorilla pressed my mom onto my dad on the outside. And so after that, she was like, wow, I don't feel very good. And then like she went to the doctor and he's just like, well, you know, the good news or bad news, you're knocked up. And she's like, excuse me? She comes out and she's like bigger than anything. Like she said she went in skinny, come out like a big chick. Right. So, um, but yeah, so I've been by myself since I was a fetus. And I think that's how I developed my scoliosis, thanks to my mother. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, mom. You what, what, what's with scoliosis? I have scoliosis too, yeah. Really? Yeah. A I actually, serious condition? No, it's not bad. Well, it's like a question mark, but I only discovered it when I actually came here. And <clears throat> I had no idea I had it until we had like a personal trainer, luckily in the um, um, NXT, FCW was what it was before. And we, uh, I was like bent over and I was doing rows and stuff like that. And the trainer was just like, whoa, like your back is messed up. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he took a picture and I was like, wow, I've never seen that before. And I got an x-ray on it and stuff, and it was like a question mark. I was just like, that's weird. Like, I've never, I thought my back was like good. Okay, so with 10 years in the business, has, yeah. has that affected you in any way, shape, or form? No, and is I mean, it supposed to present a problem down the road? It could, but you have to, like, go to a chiropractor, do some yoga or something like that, which I do. I don't do any of any of those, so that's probably an issue in the, in the future. There's a very interesting uh, documentary on YouTube that I found, found, and it's called The Wrestlers, Fighting With My Family. Yeah. And y'all filmed this. And yeah, what was the motivation behind film, filming this? Because I would recommend everybody watch it to get more of a backstory of, of where you came from. Yeah. But whose idea was it to film that? It wasn't actually any of our ideas. So growing up, um, obviously our family is very unusual. We are a wrestling family in England, and we don't have that, you know. So um, we had a lot of you know, people come up to us, like, asking for documentaries, and we do it all, all the way through growing up. Like, you, you'll see me doing documentaries where I'm in the bath at, like, two years old, like, you know, people filming me, you know? And this one guy saw a documentary, um, Muscles and Mascara, I think it was, and it was about my mom. I think that was it. And then he confronted them and was like, okay, we want to do this documentary. And um, they were like, okay, but what are we going to base this documentary on? Just the family? And that's me when I was training. Uh -huh. um, and... My dad was like, well, she actually has a trial at WWE coming up. And this is my second trial because I didn't get in the first time. 
but uh, my second try come up and they were like this is perfect so we're going to show you know the the grind up until you try out and maybe if you get in a successful story you know and, and let's uh, go back before we get into you know the the years when uh, you signed with WWE at 18 which yeah. is which is crazy but you know Growing up, you know, you were in the ring, you were traveling all over the world uh, at 14, mm -hmm. but before that, you were tending a bar. I was tending a bar. <laughs> and, uh, but you were doing other things yeah. as well, because I heard you were also bouncing. I was bouncing, now, yes. how does this happen? Yes, so, okay, so obviously my, my mother... England is a lot different than the United States, because this wasn't very long <laughs> no, ago. The, the lady's only 23 years and old. It still isn't legal, but yeah, I've done a lot in my lifetime, which is really weird, but yeah, so basically my mom and dad would go away and they'd leave me in charge, because sometimes my brother can, you know, have a few too many in the, in the bar at that time, so it'd be me, 15 years old, looking after this bar. So, um... We'd always get people in there, but then one day my mom and dad was there and they were tending the bar. But these two chicks were fighting near the freak machine down there and no one was there. So I ran up to this woman, grabbed her in a headlock and did a headlock takeover and took her down. And then this other one tried to come at me and I grabbed her in a headlock. So I'm sitting on one's head like this and I got another one in the headlock and I'm like, boom, stop moving. So I'm 15 years old holding these two chicks down. My mom had to come running down. I, the amount of times I had to do that, I like pinned a guy up against a wall because he was trying to like, um, he was being mean to, you know, one of my friends. So uh, he he was there for his, you know, he he was. He, he like guys or like he, he right. found that as an issue so he was being very rude and very disrespectful so then he like went up to him and tried to glass him and I just rugby tackled him into the wall and like held him there I don't know I had like this mum strength or something but like I managed to pin him up against the wall while you know my friend Sam was taken out and so yeah I did bouncing in my time so then uh, with with everything else that was going on in your life with the travel with bouncing I mean did y'all yeah. did, did have just, just different wrestlers coming to the household, needing places to stay when they were working for y'all? All the time. We always... So how was that? I mean, this this is not a... I mean, it's different. It's Not everybody grows up like this. So what was it like with the rotating cast of the interesting personalities, we'll say, in the business of professional wrestling? The most exciting part is that we'd have American wrestlers come over. So Jake the Snake lived with us for a little while. It was the most wildest thing, and he was so sweet, and he used to, you know, get the snakes, like... He used to take snakes from the pet shops over there and bring them in. And then he um, ripped a piece of his boot up for me, and I still have it, and he signed it for me. And um, that was, like, my lucky thing from him. But, yeah, I got to meet Yokozuna. I got to meet the Bushwhackers. Like, you know, Greg the Hammer, like, you know, the Hammer Valentine. Like, I got to meet all these people. It was awesome. Like, I loved it. Like, I did all, you know, I was always around, like, a billion people all the time. Well, let's go to a tw uh, Twitter question right now. And uh, they want to know, uh, people on Twitter, which superstar and diva did you look up to as a child? Well, um, diva-wise, I looked up to Bull Nakano, which obviously I do her submission, but a little bit modified. I looked up to Lita. I dressed up as her. There she is, that beautiful woman. Bull Nakano. Yeah, she was a she was a bad ass. She was. Yes, um, she was awesome. And um, Lita, because you know what, I actually dressed up as Lita for Halloween before. I stole my mom's underwear and had like her underwear up to my sh my shoulder blades before. <laughs> it was like disgusting. But my mom was like, "Well, you, are you wearing my underwear?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm Lita, mom." Um, but yeah, I dressed up as her. And you, like, I was obs I was obsessed with you. Okay, tell, tell <laughs> me, kidding. tell me how I, well, I have. I have like I was you, and actually, I loved Rikishi. Like those two, like you two are my my favorites. You because um, it was it was mostly your your character was just so cool when I was growing up. I was like, man, this is guy coming down a quad bike, drinking beers, flipping people off. I was like, this is this is madness. And the fact that you didn't change your character, whether you were heel or babyface, and that's something that I really looked up to. And so I was trying to do it, especially in WWE. I'm trying to be more like you, you know, like page 316. No, it, but, but it's interesting, you know, a bald-headed guy with a goatee you know, can resonate with, uh, at the time you were a teenager, yeah. and strike a chord with you. Oh, I was like in love, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself, I was in love with you, like I loved, I was like, this guy is awesome, like, am I embarrassing myself? Because I feel like, <laughs> but yeah, no, you but, know but, what but, I mean. But no, but okay, like, so in talking about, you know, uh, I was able to maybe influence you, and I'll obviously, you know, Bull Nakano, yeah. Lita, yeah. And, uh, earlier you mentioned Alundra Blaze. Alundra Blaze, but you guys all just stood out to me. But let's you talk know, about the character like of Paige, because uh, in, in England, you, you yeah. wrestled as Brittany Knight? I did. <laughs> okay, yeah. so... Uh, that was a funny story. Actually, uh, I, I was first in a tag team called the Norfolk Dolls, which I recommend anyone to watch this movie. It's called uh, California Dolls, or the Marbles from the 70s, and it's their wrestling movie about a female tag team. 
But yeah, I was called the Norfolk Doll, Brittany Knight. So tell me about Paige now. Okay, so all of a sudden you go for your first tryout and you're rejected. Because, yeah. I mean, you, why were you rejected? You tried to be a diva. I tried to be a diva. So I got this tryout from, you know, uh, Drew McDonald, who uh, sadly passed away this year. He got me uh, the tryout. And he was just like, you need to be a diva. Like, I was like, I don't know how to be a diva. I, don't, I, barely, I still don't even know how to brush my hair properly. Like, you know, I can't do makeup. I can't do this. But I was like, oh, well, I'm going to give it my, my best shot. So I got a spray tan. I um, got someone to do my hair. Like, I, I had colorful makeup on. I had, co like, a colorful dress. Um, that's funny. And I was I was just all in color. How did you feel when you got gussied up like that? Oh, my God. I was not I was not in any way confident. Like, I hated the way I was dressed. And I was so tan. And I was just like, I look, like, not that like I'm against anyone who's tan, but it just didn't suit me. Like, I didn't feel comfortable like that, you know? So, like, just walking through, I was just, like, very timid and very, like, placid and didn't really want to, like, you know. And then I had my tryout with it, with this with this woman called Lisa Fury, and I, like, busted her lip open in the trial because I was just so nervous. And they were like, yeah, well, you know, maybe come back next time, you know, maybe get some more, like, you have to be more confident, you know. I, I feel like they could tell that I wasn't being me. Right. So, um, luckily, actually, Johnny Ace managed to get me a second trial, which was awesome. And um, I was, it was only six months later, but you know, I came back and I was like, well, I'm gonna come back as myself. If they don't like it, fine, but I'm not gonna try and be something I'm not. Like, I refuse to be, you know? So I come back, dark hair, piercings, black clothes, and they were just like, right. And the ones who were running the tryout was actually Jay Renewable and Goldust. Right. And it was funny because um, there was literally, it was, two, it was, we were in the ring for like two and a half hours. And um, I remember Jamie Noble, he probably won't remember this, but I was the only girl at the tryout, the rest were guys, one of them being, being Zach, and we had to tag in and out. And then Jamie comes up to me, he was like, hey, tag yourself in, we want to see you and your brother again. Right. So I was like, man, I'm going to get heat for this, but I was like, all right, this big old bodybuilder's backing up, I'm like, boom, tag myself in. I was like, sucker, I'm, I'm taking over. <laughs> so me and Zach, we beat the crap out of each other. For like, like literally half the time we're in the ring. Like it was, it was ludicrous. We were sweating, but it was awesome because then uh, Goldust took me aside and then he was like teaching me the stuff that I went wrong, and I was just like, but this. What is kind of stuff were you doing wrong? Because there's a difference between European well, style and American style. So what, what was actually you critiquing? Um, you know, it's it's the the stuff in between. I think we were doing the international spots. We were right. doing like headlocks and off tackle, but you know, I was doing things where I just wasn't like selling the things in between so like I he that get me in a headlock I send him off and I'm just like stand there like right waiting for it he was just like no sell it like go down right. come back up then get hit you know um but he was teaching me like the ins and outs which is awesome right so when, when you ended up in uh, NXT down in Florida, uh, yeah. you came with a very physical style because that's the way you're brought up. You're uh, wrestling with your brothers. Summer and your Ray would tell you about that. Yeah. Ooh. So, I mean, you kind of had a reputation. And Ooh, I like yeah. to work snug. And, man, I was just talking. We were just talking to Road Dog while yeah. ago. And we were laughing about when those guys were feeding my comebacks. And But from from the way you, you were brought up, I mean, especially with the family of oh, wrestlers, yeah. you're, you're protecting the business. Stiff you're laying everything in. Yeah. What you, do you call it? Stiff but safe. Right. Is what my family used to call it. So, yeah, be snug, but as long as it looks good and you're not really hurting anyone, cool. So, like, I would, I would get in there and all the wrestling moves would be different names. Like, everything would be different. And the girls just didn't like me. So, like, the first couple of months, it why wasn't... Didn't like, why, why didn't it not like you? Well, I got told in the end um, by actually Shaw Guerrero. She comes up to me and she's so freaking... We become really good friends afterwards. But at first she was like, no, I was just intimidated by the way you look. Because I came in like, <laughs> like right. this, like crazy woman. Yeah. Some great pictures you're showing, guys. Um, you know, and I, I came in looking like that. I already had wrestling experience. You know, I looked different. And she was like, I was personally intimidated by that. And I apologize. Like, people were just mean. Like, they were mean. And then Summer, poor Summer Ray, I've always been friends with her from day one. Because right. we were, like, two weeks apart. I gave her a tackle, which in England we call check. Yeah. So, like, and she's used to coming down for girls because she's so tall. But with me, like, and I stick it in. So like we, we run this spot and I, I give her this tackle and I smack her straight in the teeth and she lays on the ground and she starts crying and all the girls was like, she's trying to sabotage you. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to sabotage anyone. It's I called an accident. Her, it's an accident. It's what wrestling is. Like, give me your receipt. I don't care. Like yeah. freaking smack me around the face. Like, yeah. Tell, yeah. So you're known for your physicality. You've, you've dialed it back a little bit. But tell me about if you're influenced by the three women that you just named, uh, a little bit of Stone Cold. Tell me about you know the tr the transition into Paige uh, because if, if Stone Cold goes out, you know he, yeah. he's selling cans of whoop ass. If The Rock goes out, yeah. he's selling electricity. If right. The Undertaker goes out, it, it's that phenom and the the, the, mis the, the mystique yeah. that he has. What? Tell me about who and what Paige is. 
Well, Paige, I mostly, this is gonna sound like really cheesy because I'm sitting right next to you, but it's ba mostly based on you. And, um, and Paige being so different is basically me, but an exaggerated version as well. But like, I always wanted to be the girl that stood out, the anti-diva, someone who was different. And that's where, um, where, well, Paul Lacano was, you know, or Lita right. was always someone that stood out. It was very special. Like you always could tell them from a crowd, you know, like, oh man, she must be someone, but in a different way. So like, I just got all those qualities and put them into Paige, especially like, you know, taking some from my mum's style too, and bringing that in. And you know, Dusty Rhodes helped me a lot in that. Talk like, about Dusty. I mean, he, he just just passed away, but man, he was a guy who was one of the first guys that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And you know he was in a, he was in a ring bleeding. Someone had an iron claw on him. I was hooked. Yeah. What did Dusty Rhodes do for you? He kept me sane and insanity a hundred percent because there was a lot of times where I just wanted to break. Like wh whether people think it or not, this job is hard, and I moved across the world. When you say that, well, whether people think it or, that or not, this job is well, hard. People, some people think like, oh, they're on TV, like they're in these cameras, they're, they're you know, people love them, they, they have fans. It's, that's the cool part, sure, and you get to travel the world. Yeah, there's amazing. a little bit of glamour that, that, that looks nice, but right. when you get in the grind, it's, yes. it's... And people obviously don't understand that, and I moved across the world, and I was by myself at 18, you know, so Dusty was so sweet, and, and he took me in, and there was just points where I was like, these girls are mean to me, I can't get it, I can't understand, like, like how long am I gonna be here for? Like, I just, I was just breaking down, and he was so helpful, and he's always just like, I want you to be this girl, and he would point me, at he's like, you be you, like, you're it, and then Cody, his son actually said it, in the best way, he liked his broken toys as well. You know, the, whoever was like the full package, he was just like, okay, he was great with, but those broken toys, like he spent more attention with and he wanted to fix up and shine up and send on their way, you know? So he spent a lot of time with me. I was his princess. Well, <laughs> I love the, 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 the guy who has a magical lisp. <laughs> I love him. What's, I, and I did too. What's the best advice that he ever gave you? Oh man, he, this actually, I have a, a story about him actually. Um, he was always saving money, first of all. I love that. <laughs> you're 23 and you get it. Because yeah. in, in a documentary, I, I don't want to cut you off, but you're talking about all these things you want to buy. I was joking, and I hate that they put that in there. I was joking about that. But no, back like, in oh, old days, yeah. it, back when the dinosaurs still roamed the earth, you know, the, yeah. the promoters yeah. or the guys that, that, that were in charge of bookers, they'd always tell you, kids save you money. Yeah. So the, you're 23, and he would tell you that is so special. No, and I did. And you know, the first year I didn't save it very well. Obviously, I'm 18. I'm finally earning some good money. I'm like, oh, this is great. Yeah, yeah. Spend it on this, spend it on that. Biggest mistake ever because I have to pay tax at the end of the year, and I didn't realize that. Um, but I save after that, and I save now, and I don't throw my money away like that. I save. I pay my tax. Like is is good, and I, I thank him for it. But I have a story. Like so, he would run all the promo classes yeah. down there, and he'd be like. Paige, baby, I, I don't want you to talk. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you want me to do the promo? What do you mean you don't want me to talk? And so I used to always have to try and come up with promos where it was still at least 30 seconds long, but literally only saying one sentence. And I literally got so frustrated one day, and he just wanted the best for me, I know that. But I just said this one sentence and was just like, okay, like this. I was just like done, you know, like I just couldn't think of any more. I couldn't get as creative. And he was like, baby, I asked you for chicken dinner and you give me a chicken. <laughs> I can't say it. Beep. And I was just like, oh, and like that. I was like, Dusty. And like, he was just like, well, baby, like, oh. And then he started shouting at me in front of everyone. And this is the first time he shouted at me before. And I was just like, because he's always been hard on me, especially like the first couple of weeks I was there, he would always call up, call me up to do extra promos and he'd be like, okay, you're in love with Roman Reigns and he stole your toaster, go. And I'm like, I've just met these guys. Like, how do I do this? Like, you know, so I'm like, uh, and I call him an, a mother, right? Yeah. I called him it. I was just like, all right, I'm going to call you the mother. How did the dream respond to you calling that? So I do that and I storm out and I run up the stairs, the performance center, I go in the, in the locker room like, mm, like this, right? And <laughs> He comes running up the stairs after me and he sends one of the girls in. The girl's is like, hey, Dust is outside. And I was like, no, I don't want to speak to him right now, you know, because he was like a father figure, you know. I'm just like, no, I'm mad at him. So then, um, and then Dusty opens the door. He's like, baby, you get your ass out of here right now. And then he's like shouting at me. I'm like, okay, I'm coming out. And he, like, we sat on the steps in the performance center um, and we sat there for like a good 20 minutes. 
and he was like, baby, I just wanted to tell you, you know, he, he just wanted the best for me. And he was like, and I asked you to do this, you know, and you do deliver, but today you didn't. And like, this is a critique you're going to get, you know, but he just sat there and he was just like, I know you have something special. And he was like, and I know you could be a big star one day. He was just like, but I just want the best for you. And like, you just didn't bring it today. And he was just so sweet. And then we laughed about it. And he was like, and you were the first person to ever call me and mother ever and get, <laughs> get away with it. I was like, sorry, Jesse. But who's to tell people that story? Here's the, here's the thing I got for you. I mean, w with promos, I mean, what was the hang up? Because in, in watching, you know, all the videos that I watched, you know, and, and getting ready for this conversation, you're out, uh, you know, hustling on the street, passing out flyers, yeah. talking to people, trying to get people in yeah. the building. And then, you know, you're working the crowd, you're ne clapping. I never mean, you're did a engaged. promo before, before I come over here. So, so what's the difference? I mean, and, and, and in talking to you and, and, and listen to you interact with people, yeah. you're you're just uh, chatty, yeah. Kathy. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're just like I'm all love it. Shut up. Yeah. Tell, um, w w why the hang up or why the disconnect with the uh, promo? I don't. Well, the thing is, I did promos, but I didn't realize how you could tell a story in a, in, a, in a promo. Like, there's me passing out flyers. So, like, all I did, I used to build rings. And um, I take them up, put them down, take them up, put them down, like maybe three or four times a day right. on the holiday camps, you know. And um, even when I got my wrist broken and, and I got knocked out, my dad was like, come on. There's some stories there with my dad. Oh, my gosh. He was, Go there. He's a tough guy. He, uh, he, um, I got hit by a car one day. And like, boom, like, <laughs> and I'm like skinning across the floor. I was on the car bonnet. I was bleeding everywhere, like coming up my ears, like, don't and I remember standing up like, oh my gosh, what just happened? And I see my brother screaming, everything's in slow motion. And I just fall down. It's like something that, like the zombie apocalypse. I'm just like scraping myself to like the front door. And like everyone comes running out screaming like, oh my gosh, Saray, are you okay? And they're like dragging me in. And I'm just like, oh my God. You, you know? my car. Ah, I just got my car. My limb's hanging off. And my dad's like, can you wiggle your toes? And I'm like... Yeah, and he's like, all right, get ready. We have a show to do today. So we, go, we went and, got and done the show, and they just bandaged me up. And literally, and we did it again. I, I broke my, my scaphoid bone. I don't know how you pronounce that in an American accent, but I broke my scaphoid bone in my wrist on a Samoan, which I wasn't ready for with my mom. Right. And um, my dad had, like, this little makeshift cast in, in, his, in his bag, so he just, like, threw it at me. He's like, hey, put it on. I was like... Okay, and he's like, right, we're back, we're back, ready to go tomorrow. I was like, Ugh. he's like, but you don't have to put the ring down today. I was like, okay. He's like, but you have to put the ring up tomorrow. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I was like, all right, thanks, Dad. So how does uh, you know the, the travel on the road and back in the day with you know the lack of uh, you know medical and today you know with right. all the trainers, it, it's, it's a totally different system. Totally different. Cause but you just... but the mindset from from the, the background you come from is you work when you're hurt. Yeah. Because that's just and what I you do. And I didn't stand that here and like. WWE is so great with, you know, people who even get the slightest injury, a sprain, or, or like they break a nail or something like that. They're straight on, like, okay, you okay? Do you need some time off? You know, like, they're very good like that. Whereas I look at girls, I used to look at girls in the, in the performance center and just be like, what are you in there for? Like, get, get up, like, brush yourself off, get back in the ring. And that used to annoy me, but I realized, like, they didn't get brought up in the business the way I did. Right. You know, like, my... Like, now, now, what's your what's your mindset on that? Because you paid a lot of dues. And, you know, right. last week or whatever it was on uh, Monday Night Raw, John Cena, a vicious, broken oh. nose. And that dude's one of the toughest like guys Harry in the business. Harry Ma from her limit. He comes back early from all injuries, but but he keeps going. Right. But, and so, but that's the same That's the way background. it is. I was yeah. just like, good for him. And I was just like, everyone's like, that's great. It, it is courageous. It's awesome. And he that's because he's old school, you know, and like I look at it that way if I if I ever got a broken nose and match I would want to carry on I wouldn't want anyone to stop the match same as Daniel Bryan You know like he he got like busted open He still wanted to carry on his match and they, they just wouldn't let him and and but yeah That's how we used to do it. Like I busted my mom in the nose. I kicked her right in the face and she carried on and we broke my wrist carried on like I got knocked out still carried on I'm like ooh. I got it before, before I move on. I, I want to give your mom some props. I, you know, I watched the match when uh, you and your mother were working against each other. She's working yeah. heel, you're working babyface. The match was 2011. You're what, 18 years uh -huh. old? And she's a heel. And she is oh. just despicable. She's cheating. You she's need to look sneaky. Up yeah. She's vicious. She's, old she's calculating. Yeah. And she's taking her time. She's yeah. a 20 year vet. Yeah. But anyway, I want to give her a shout out for, the, awesome. for the awesome work. And, and this is from uh, World Association of Wrestling. Right. Uh, so anyway, I, She's awesome. And how big of an influence was she with with regards to, first of all, toughness, but then ring psychology and execution of work? Oh, she she because we we worked each other a lot as in WrestleMania, but that we we worked each other so often. But like, um, if I would rush, she would literally boom, 
smack me and she, like I would like I'm like me like in tears and she'd just be like hey you're rushing too much you need to slow down and that's just that's just how we're raised and it was the best thing and then once I got a little bit older I got a little bit cockier and I'd like hit her back and stuff like that she'd be like don't don't take but yeah that, that's just how it was and that's how I was the first couple of weeks I was in FCW if someone would rush I'd be like boom and they were like you can't do that here and I'm like what are we talking about and, but like, so, and, do, right? and sometimes though you, you do just because of, of time dynamics yeah. so yeah. sometimes it is what it is but yeah, you know, to, yeah. to, to, to your point yeah when it milk something for all it's worth and then yeah. in today's day and age it is a faster moving product and exactly. so you, you have to proceed accordingly yeah. you know in, in a lot of the interviews that, that I saw of you uh, over and over and over again you would you would say uh, when someone asked for your autograph you go why, why do you like me why do you want my autograph yeah. and so I, I want to ask you I mean from from uh, is it uh, is it a confidence level or do you not see why people would want your autograph because you always it's, ask the same question why, why do you, do like you me? want why do you like me yeah because like you know i i don't know if it's a confidence thing but you know i go out there and I, i'm confident really really confident but then outside i'm just like wow you got all these like gorgeous i feel like it's more of like a low self-esteem thing like you have all these gorgeous women all these crazy superstars and i'm like this little girl from a little town in like the middle of like England, nowhere, and then I'm like, why do you want my autograph? Like, why do you like me? Like, what what do I do to like, you know? It's but but so so just so that I you know uh, I I read it. Uh, the Rock gave you a great piece of advice. Yeah. What was that? Stay humble and hungry. Right. Because you know you always want to um, have more and more goals, you know, and you always want to try and reach them. So always be passionate and humble because you know what? Like a lot of people are not going to want to work with you if you're a complete a hole. <laughs> right, but so so then, then you know I, I want to give you uh, uh, and think something to take from this conversation as well, uh, because when people ask for your autograph, you know you have struck a chord with them and they get to live vicariously through yeah. what you're doing. And all the years that, that I was in the ring, I had so much fun and it was a blast. It was a rocket ride, and I knew that I was kicking ass. And we were, uh, you know, in you know it was a whole roster of yeah. Jesus. Hall of Famers, so we're having a great time. It wasn't until I was on the Hall of Fame, you know, there, and they did a five-minute video package, and I was like able to see, okay, dude, this is actually what you were doing. Yeah. So my advice to you, a 10-year vet at only 23 years of age, when you get a chance and you're not on the road, sometime when you're at your crib in Florida, just step back because some sometimes I think it you can get so far in the forest you can't see the trees. Right. So step away from it for a second. I know you're totally immersed in it, and it's your your entire life. And who knows? It probably will be for another ten or fifteen years. But realize what you're doing and how powerful that your presence is, and how passionate the WWE fans are. Yeah. And realize why you impact these lives. Because look at the story you just said. You know, and just hey, just some kid, some girl from from North England. Why? Right. And it, it, I I kind of like when I watched the Total Divas back, Ashley, and. Um, I realized, like, I'm the the message I I, I always want to give out is you want to be yourself, right. and you know I know a lot of people like preach that all the time, and you know they're not really doing it, but like I feel like I do it, you know, and like this girl comes running up to me, crying her eyes out, and she's like, you know what, you made me get over my eating disorder. I went to Wizard World this weekend, and like five people, like different people, guys and girls, come up to me crying. They were like, "You helped me get over my anxiety. You helped me be more confident. You helped me think like, oh, it doesn't really matter what people think of you. Like, I can dress the way I want. I can look the way I want. I can be the way I want." And I like, I have to keep. I'm like, yeah, like that's so weird. Like, I'm like, I'm getting it out there, and that's that's all I want. But um, I said that I, I was gonna tell. I told Daniel Bryan. I tell a story about how he met my family. So we'll get into that soon as well. So I tell you. Uh, let's go back to uh, Florida for a second. Yeah. Uh, Triple H has been uh, a big influence on you. Huge, huge, huge influence. You know, he gave me, I actually went for a stage, this reminds me, I actually went for a stage at this point where I had so much bad luck. I got uh, I got in a car accident. I um, had to have surgery. Uh, so I was out for three months. I got my bank account, like I ordered something online and it, it got completely hacked, money taken from me and I couldn't pay for my surgery. So like, and my dog got hit by a car. So I was like upset. So at this point, um, like Triple H um, was, I was just like, I'm just ready to come back. I have like so much like bad luck and stuff going on. And he was so great and he was just like, I'll get you back a week earlier for this. So he gave me the opportunity to, like to come back, you know, and um, like literally that was my first 
day back and I, from surgery and, you know, we did the whole championship thing. But he, he helped. So that was your first NXT. You're yeah. the first women's NXT champion. Yeah, I was buzzed. At, and I was just like, what? Like, how, how is that possible? Like, to make history in the WWE at, like, only, like, 21 at that point. Like, I, it, blows my, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. And, you know, Emma is, like, a, such an amazing talent as well and getting to work with her. And, you know, she's come from the same similar background, you know. She's, she's done the grind and, and right. stuff prior. You know, she's been doing it since she was 13. So it's just like to work with her and do this and Triple H give us the opportunity to do it. Because I feel like that's how, how the whole Diva revolution started was because of him. Well, it, you mentioned it. It's a Twitter question. I want to ask yeah. you about that. Uh, the Diva revolution. Did you start it? I feel like... Okay, well, let's, what do you think has been the best thing about the Diva Rev revolution and why? Um, I just think them giving us a lot of time to actually tell a story and showcase what we can actually do is probably the best thing. Opportunity. Yes, but like I feel like Triple H was definitely the one that started it when it comes to NXT. You know, you had AJ who was different, quirky, but you know, wrestling side of things, she didn't do that very often, and she was amazing. Like I looked up to her as well because she was different. But he gave us an opportunity. He's like, hey, you're gonna have like 20 minutes for this uh, NXT match, and we're just like, what? That's great. Wow. Yeah. You know, and this is the first like live special we're gonna have on the WWE Network. No other pay-per-view's been on there. We were the first pay-per-view and it was like NXT. And he gave, gave me and Emma the opportunity to do that. Which like, and Stephanie was there as well. And she, it, just, it just blew my mind. So I feel like he kind of started it and then me and Emma kind of got the ball rolling with but, that. Okay, so then you and your Emma, did you start the revolution? Because then, you know, then you know, in the wake, here comes Charlotte, Sasha, Bailey, uh, Becky. Uh, I these women come along. Did you open the door? I feel like it was definitely, uh, we opened the door, but having Sarah Del Rey as well come in, who's an amazing, amazing, like, entertainer, wrestler, whatever you want to call it, you know, like, she was awesome, and I actually worked with her on the indies, not in a match, but we worked on the same shows, you know, so having her in there and teaching her, teaching the girls, not just a diva way of wrestling, but a man's way of wrestling too, like a superstar way of wrestling, and, and, it, and you know, I... Fit, fit Finley too. Once we come up here, he gave us the opportunity to do so. Phenomenal. Yeah, Dean Malenko right now is phenomenal. Amazing. I yeah. I actually go to Dean a lot nowadays. Like I'll go up to him and, and talk to him about a lot of stuff. But yeah, so I feel like that them as a whole, not just me, but Triple H, were giving us the opportunity and us for you know delivering a, a match and showing what girls can actually do. And then you know Sarah Del Rey coming in, and then you know it just it's like a ladder and everyone. Yeah, hey, I saw some old training. Uh, I saw some old traveling uh, videos of y'all in England. Uh, mm -hmm. and y'all are just some brown guard just hauling ass down the highway. <laughs> There's air <laughs> flying everywhere, yeah. windows and down. <laughs> How you break it, down all the time. How's it travel from uh, back <laughs> into to these days? I mean, who do you travel? Are you traveling solo? Uh, you I, got gals packed in the car trying yeah. to cut back expenses? Usually I travel, you know, we, we, <laughs> usually, sometimes I travel by myself. But, you know, I have Alicia Fox, which I travel with a lot. I used to travel with Emma. But, yeah, we, we get our rental cars now and we have our, our hotels and, you know, they get our flights and stuff like that. But in, in you know, England, we would, like, get in these crappy little cars and try and all squeeze in there, like, five or six of us, like, try to, like, get to the next town. And we, we'd break down on the side of the road all the time. Like, we'd have to stop at gas stations and eat the sandwiches out of there. Like, it's, it's definitely different. It's way nicer here. Way nicer. Man, I tell you, I, I was, I'm real good friends with William Regal. Yeah. And we were down in Blackpool one time, and we were down at uh, visiting a bunch of his uh, friends. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, there was a wrestling ring set up. And, uh, you know, the guys were actually, you know, bringing the people in, right. the marks in, and you know, doing their oh, thing. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I'll never forget it, because, I mean, it was, like, really basic and pretty low-key, you know, like, like you passing out those flyers. Yeah. And I'll never forget one of the guys, I can't remember his name, but I'll never forget what he told me. You know, I don't think I was, at that time, you know, pretty white height on top of the world, and we shook hands as, I, as, I, as we left, and I said, hey, man, nice to meet you. And he looked at me, he goes, he goes, Steve, he goes, enjoy life. And I was like... Man, here's a guy who's working his ass off to get these people to come in here, and we're selling out, you know, 20,000 square foot, I mean, 20,000 seat arenas, you know, night after night. It doesn't matter what day of the week it is. Yeah. And here's this guy telling me to enjoy life, and I never forgot that. 
Are you enjoying life? I mean, oh. the pressure cooker's on because it, it looks all fun and, and, and you know, fine and dandy and glamorous, but there is a grind to it. Yeah, that's 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 what I actually tell my friends and my family. Like, I have to have that fun, you know. Like, I have to still have have another life out of this. Like, a, you know. So, like, yes, I travel and like I'm I'm working a lot, but you know, I wouldn't have any other way. But after the show, like, hey, we'll go out, we'll go hang out, we'll go to eat, we'll go, you know, to a bar. <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, we'll we'll have a we'll have a good time because like, and then I'll just go on random trips. Like the two days that we we sometimes have off a week. I, I just went to Costa Rica one week. We went to Tulum, like in Mexico. We went, like we just take like little random trips just because you know, like you know you you have this one life and you know you have to try and live it as much as you can, and you have to try and feel normal as well. At ten years, where, where do you feel you are in the business? Oh, I'm still learning. I'm still like, I've got so much. I, I'm still super fresh here. So I feel like I've kind of started over again, like kind of like a restart. But um, I've still got a lot of time. Well, yeah, you still got a lot of time. Yeah, yeah you're only 23. But yeah. I always consider that 10 year mark kind of be the holy grail, you know, mark where you you really know from a heel baby face perspective of what's going on in the, the lay of the land yeah. with what promoters, you know, want you to do with yeah. regard to storyline, the details. Obviously, you're probably mechanically proficient in the five year zone, but that 10 year mark, as I always talk to Arn Anderson, that's when you really have that's it like all together. That's like a milestone for sure. Yeah. Do you feel like you have that all put together? I feel like some days I do, some days I don't. Like it's really, it's so strange. It's so strange. Like I feel like obviously I know what I feel like I know what I'm doing, and I know what I want to do. But like there's still some days where I'm just like, man, do I still not get it? Like because. Well, tell me about the transition from being. I mean, when you started with NXT, I mean, you already had six, seven years in the business. Yeah. I mean, you had to be light years ahead of everybody from from, from one standpoint, but yeah. because you were from a European style, yeah. what was learning the WWE? You know. So uh, it's, playbook like it's, it's, it's being bigger as well because we're always we we do it in front of like sometimes even twelve people and we're so we're so small we don't show out too big you know and this is like this is entertainment like you you have to do it to like you know there's millions inside a camera and then there's thousands in an arena and you have to learn how to like you know show show both of these people you know right. you have to learn how to entertain these people like all these people on an arena and I've never ever been in front of that many people before. Even at NXT, that was one of the biggest crowds I've been in front of. Well, what was, uh, yeah, I, I've worked at some, well, I used to work in, you know, uh, car dealerships, you know, the parking lots, getting suplexed on the parking lots. And, you know, there was like, you know, 15, 20 people there. So you talk about the people, you know, 12 people, 15, sometimes you have a big house or 75. Yeah. You know, these days on a good night, there's 18,000 people there. I know, I still think that. They're like, man, it's not, it's not a great crowd tonight. There's only 18, 1,800 people in this live event. I'm like, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Like that is still a lot of people to me, damn it. Like I was just like, oh, I was like, hey, do we go home for this? Or because like sometimes if we got like, my dad was very strict though. If there was only two people in there, he was like, no, we're going out there to do a show. But like sometimes there would be like uh, like two people, and the, the show would get cancelled. You know, here it was just like, oh, twelve hundred people left it. Like, like does this get cancelled because there's only twelve hundred people here? Like this is great. You gotta, you gotta give everybody their money's worth. Yeah, you exactly. And I'll go out time. there if there's one person out there and put on a show if there was like thousands in there. So. Hey, I want to talk to you a little bit about tough enough, and because oh. uh, oh. I've been, I've enjoyed, <laughs> I've enjoyed watching you on there. I'm such the bad guy, apparently. No, no, no. But here's the thing, and, and let me let me go out on a regular saying this. I hosted two thousand. I hosted uh, tough enough in two thousand eleven. Yeah. And I had a good time. I enjoyed all the, the season before mine. And I'd been out filming a project, so I hadn't got a chance to see any of the episodes. So I binge watched them yeah. uh, all six in a row. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the show is, is very interesting. I really like it. I enjoy the hell out of it. And I'm not saying that for a plug because I'm, I'll tell you exactly what's on my mind. You know that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the re one of the reasons it kind of it got met with a little bit of indifference is because of a level of expectations. Right. I think when they reincarnated it and brought it back, I think people expected to see what they saw in 2011. Yeah. The show's changed. I like the live dynamic part of it. Sometimes yeah. it feels a little bit like trying to put 15 pounds of stuff in a 10 pound bag, but I like the show. I like yeah. the franchise. Uh, I like all the moving parts, all the people in the show. Oh, it's so awesome. You were very honest with with these contestants. Uh, and, and, okay. you, and you've gotten a little bit of heat for it. Oh, tons of heat. But tons. here's my thing. Like you're, death threats. It was great. But you're a 10-year vet. Yeah, but when they you, don't When know. you get in someone's grill, 
It's because you're an established veteran and you know what the hell you're talking about. They, that's, that's the thing, like, um, people who don't know me or, like, you know, the average, because this goes out globally, worldwide. So right. a lot of non-wrestling fans are watching it, too. So they're looking at me as, like, this this 22-year-old girl, like, she's trying to give some critique to, like, these poor these poor defenseless, like, you know, people who just want to try and be wrestlers. No, that's not that's not the case whatsoever. Like, they don't know my backstory, which is frustrating. Yeah, but you're ripping but, them. I mean, yeah, they think, they, ripping, think, they think you're ripping them to shreds, and you're no, not. You're being honest. They, 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 this is coming from some, someone who's done this for 10 years yeah. and like I felt like I definitely helped her early yeah I was very very tough under the first two days but th my, my parents did that to me and they were just like and they do it to other people too I'd see them in the training and there's this girl called um, Destiny and she just wouldn't come out of her shell right so my mom got in her face and she was shouting and she was screaming at her to the point where Destiny just went smacked her on the face and she was like that's it that's the confidence I want yeah. and she just like felt she was like a new person so I was just like well why don't I use this on this girl who you know, doesn't know a wrist lock from a padlock, doesn't know, like, what, like, she's so shy, right. she, she, she's boring, like, to, like, I'm not being mean, it's just, she's You're boring. You're being honest. To, like, yeah, I'm just, like, very boring, very, like, whatever, so I was just like, well, we need some personality, I've because if not, like, she's just going to stay here because of the popularity vote. So, um, you know, I got into her and I was mean to her and I was saying stuff and it was, it wasn't like incorrect stuff. I was saying mean stuff that was right. Right. But like, you know, I did it for two weeks and on the third week I was just like, well, this is it. Like, I know that they, like whoever I put in the bottom of three at that particular point that they have to cut a promo on me. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, this is her time to do so. Right. So like, I'm like, all right, bring it on. Like, this is your time. And she, she was sweet. Afterwards, she was like, you know, like, if you would have put me in the bottom three and if I would have had to do a promo, like, I was going to call you out anyway. And I was like, good, good. But I'm glad I picked you because you know why? You stood out. Yeah, and, but here's the thing: as 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 not, I don't want to say, well, you're you're hard on them, but you're honest yeah. with them. Yeah. But that's your job. I mean, the, right. the, the show's called Tough, Tough Enough. Tough Enough. Yeah. And hello. Yeah. If that don't ring a bell, it's you not know. called that's cuddle off. That like. Yeah, and and, and this ain't easy. I, I would tell the people yeah. back in uh, 2011. I said, hey man, one of you's going to win this thing, but the toughest right. part's going to be when you actually get in the business. So that's when I'm the tough hard. part starts. Like, then... No, but here's here to to on the, to your uh, credit uh, as well. You give them positive encouragement, just like you said when you fired Sarah up and she she came back on you. And you gave her props, yeah. You know because that's that's what you're looking for. Yeah. So you're you're hard, but you're fair. Yeah. It's an honest. It, man, I tell you what, you can get a million people in this business to lie to you. It's very rare. I mean, not not rare, but when someone will look you dead in the eyes and give you the truth, I'd rather have that all day long. Don't sugarcoat nothing because the truth's going to come out sooner or later. It was it was like really hard recently because obviously the whole Patrick Clark thing. Now talk to me about the Patrick thing because you put him on blast, you put him yeah, in the bottom three. Yeah, I put three. him on blast because you know what, he's 19 and he already had an ego and that's something you don't want, like, you know, like you don't want people to find it hard to work with you because there'll be less and less people that'd be like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to work this guy. Like this guy's a, f you know, and I, like the whole point of that episode was hu like humility, you know, you right. have to be a good person, you have to be, you know. Um, you have to be respectful. Don't believe your own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. believe your own. Yeah. <laughs> we got to bleep out half. We the have show. to like bleep yeah. out a lot of our things. Um, this is great. So, so was it was it too too much ego? Um, and, and yeah, not, it and wasn't it, confidence. It was ego. It was. I just yeah. It kind of got to. He rubbed me the wrong way, and you know, it, it just. I was like, okay, well, he needs a shock. Okay. You know, like put him in the bottom three. I didn't expect him to go, but that means, you know. And people, like, as soon as he did went, I was like, wow, okay, he's gone. But, like, I got backlash on Twitter, and I'm thinking, okay, guys, the whole point of the show is you vote for who you want to stay. And at this point, like, you didn't vote for him, so you really didn't care. So why are you giving me crap about it? Like, you know, it's your fault. It's your fault. Well, it's that, your that job was the to thing. Vote. You put a guy in the bottom three, and, yeah. you know, back back in the day when I was doing it, you know, I might have had my crosshair on somebody, but I'd give them a chance to, you know, talk their way right. out of it. And sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Right. If you put someone in the bottom three, you put them there, but the the viewing public doesn't yeah. have to vote them off. If the consensus was, hey, this guy should stay, then he should have stayed. He should have stayed. So it's funny but when when you get when you get the the, the tweets like, hey, what are you doing? You should have put Patrick on uh, bottom three. They're like, bring Patrick back, and I was like, well, actually, the biggest mistake was probably this week when Mata went because I feel like Mata, whatever was said and done, he looked great. He could deliver a promo. He had character and personality whenever he needed. He could switch on. I mean, he may be like a nice, timid guy behind the scenes. Well, when he did his thing, it was just like, wow. Like you He know, stood out. He, ju he jumped he off jumped the, uh, the television was, screen for me. You know, and the, the whole thing about Amanda getting saved, like, I don't have anything against 
Amanda. I just don't think she should have got saved because she was hot. Like, that should have... Now, I want to tell so, so that the males use his safe card now. I was so, like, what are you doing, what? you idiot? What is going on around what, here? What were you thinking when I was just like, well, you're card. taking the heat off me, brother, man. <laughs> oh, God. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, I don't need... The, I was like, all right, good luck with that, because, you know, I'm... <laughs> Well, what's the uh, what's the story with uh, with Daniel Bryan? Because I've enjoyed oh, his yeah. presence on the show because uh, so, he's not been working. His book is out right now. I'm putting a plug out. Okay, we will enjoy this story too. Um, she already knows the story, but he actually I met him back in 2003, and uh, you know what was I? 11. I can't yeah. count <laughs> for some reason right now. Anyway, um, so I met him then, and he came over, and there, it was like one of those. Um, shows where there's like three in a row you know where he did like three matches in one night and uh he walks in and he like no one picked him up from the airport this is in his book but they're not named in it but this is definitely about my dad and brother anyway uh he he walked into the locker room and uh he had to make his own way there and the this he was like i just see these two guys and one's holding another guy behind the back like this and the other one's like punching him in the stomach like this and he just thought oh laugh and joke it's probably a british thing so he goes like hey guys hi i'm i'm brian da 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 and then they my dad turns around and goes hey how you doing i'm ricky knight like that and then carries on punching this guy in the stomach <laughs> so then like he leaves come back in and then he's <laughs> he sees my dad and my brother dangling this guy out the window by his feet they were like four stories in the air so, um, and then he was just like, oh, laughing and joking again. And then uh, Mal Mason comes up and he said he had like a bunch of people come up to him and was just like, I'm so sorry about tonight. And um, he was just like, what are you talking about? He, he thought it was just because you wrestle, like had to wrestle three days in a row, three times in a row. And he was like, oh no, it happens all the time in America. And he was just like, wait, what? And he was like, what are you talking about? He said, like, what are you talking about? He was like, and then he explained to him like, that was actually like, James wasn't a great about my mom. So like, they're very protective. Like we're a very protective family, especially over this one. But I've enjoyed it. Well, it, it <laughs> So they they were pretty uh, uh, aggressive protecting you back in the day. It was my brothers mostly. Um, There's my brother Asa too, but my brother Zach and Roy. Oh my gosh, they. So, okay. So if I had boys, especially my my dad would have my uncles come around and they give me like trash bags and be like, "Go give this to your boyfriend." I'm like, why? He goes, "Cause you messy mess around with you. That's what he's gonna end up in." I'm like, I can't give him this. But then they made me do it. I was like, this is what you're gonna end up in if you hurt me. But like, <laughs> there was one one time. Um, uh, one of the one of my brother's friends and and the, he was very overly flirtatious with me and he just wouldn't leave me alone like all night and I'm trying to run this bar you know like I'm trying to like do, like pull these drinks and stuff like that and this guy won't leave me alone so my brother just grabs a pool cue and smacks him around the head with it and this guy's eyes went he fell down come back up and he was like sorry Roy I didn't mean to play and he, like they respected my brother so much that they were like they were like okay like I pushed the line Zach did it once and uh, this guy wouldn't leave me alone one of his friends again. And it was in the middle of the mile, and he, he called me. He's like, hey, Ray, you should probably come to the mile. I was like, why? He was like, well, I got, what's his name, um, in the mile right now. I was like, right? He was like, yeah, um, I punched him. He's on the floor. You should probably get in there because he wants to kiss your feet. I was like, he's not going to kiss my feet, Zach. He can't kiss my feet. Like, so, because he, he like did something like rotten to me. So, they're very protective. My brother Asa grabbed ice from a pond, and like this, this, my boyfriend at the time, and just hit him around the head with it. I was just like... I could never have fun. Like, I couldn't go out to clubs because my brothers knew everyone, every bouncer, so they were all just like this looking at me, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to go home. Like, I'm just going to go home. But, yeah, now I now I look after them. So you, you miss them, obviously. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, I miss them all the time. Zach just had another baby. Like, Roy's got three kids. Zach's got two. Um, my brother Asa, he's actually very sick, and he's in, in this uh, mental institution, but he's doing really well. My sister, like, she has kids. Their, their kids have kids. It's, it's wild. But it's, it's like, I feel sad not, you know, seeing them grow up, but, like, they do such a good job of, like, you know, making them remember me. I'll send them, like, action figures and merchandise, and they'll see me on TV. And what do you do when you're not doing this? Any hobbies? Yeah, I, I go to gigs. I like to go, mu I like, music. I go hang out with friends. Like um, like I said, I go on random trips. But, you know, we should, like, you know, a couple of Steve Wises. I'm just kidding. I don't want to say that. What do you drink? I drink beer and whiskey. What kind of whiskey? I drink um, Bullet... Um, I also drink Jack and I drink Maker's Mark and then beer, I drink Purple Haze, I drink Bud Light, I drink Budweiser, I literally drink really any beer, I'm, I'm a big 
Beer enthusiast. When you got into the business of uh, sports entertainment slash pro wrestling, yeah. did, did you have any goals? I mean, I just got in because I wanted to be a pro wrestler. Do you have any goals now? I mean, you've been two-time NXT Women's yeah. Champion. First time. Uh, uh, yeah, no, yeah. So I was two-time Divas Champion, uh, NXT Champion. I was right. a double champion, um, the youngest champion. Yeah, I have, like, tons of goals. I obviously want to be Divas Champion again. You know, I want to be a longest reigning Divas Champion. I want to have another, another WrestleMania match. And one day, like, I really, really, really want to be in the Hall of Fame. Like, that's a huge goal of mine. I think that's about us. See, that would be really cool around my waist. And also, maybe change that into the women's championship. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I love it. <laughs> WrestleMania 32. Mm -hmm. Right around the corner, really, it's, as you speak. Yeah, it goes really quickly. Do you think you'll be in it? I hope so. If not, I'm going to try and put myself in there. <laughs> just make a run in. I'm like, I don't care. I want to be part of this. You know? Say again? Sorry about that. Somebody talking to me. Uh, <laughs> WrestleMania is going to be uh, so AT and T Stadium in Dallas, Texas. One hundred five thousand yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, can you can you imagine uh, that many people being in an arena? No, because I've only just you know worked in front of like the last WrestleMania crowd. And how much is that? Like over eighty thousand. Just that actually, everyone kind of disappeared, and I only saw my mom in the front row. <laughs> you know, that was like wild. But I can't imagine doing it in front of that many people. You can't hear anything. Dean Malenko said, you know what? He was like, there's a lot of people in there, but you can hear a pin drop because it's so big and like there's no ceiling. So I was just like, I was expecting like loud reaction. You're like walking out like, wow, it's like crickets. People hate me. It's just like, no, you just can't hear it. And that's, you know, we were in uh, Ford Field uh, several years ago is when uh, Vince was against Donald Trump. He had the teams working <laughs> against him. And the thing about it was that thing is 90,000 seats uh, big. And so we really thought you know, we were sticking the joint out. We couldn't hear the sound yeah. because the sound was disappearing up above. Yeah. We yeah. didn't have the, the, the speakers around. So, man, it was really bad inside because we thought we had lost everything. But the, the people were really into the match. We just didn't know it. Yeah, yeah. And that's how, what, like, I was. But then, like, Dean kind of clued me up. His was like, no, it's just because there's no ceiling. But the, they were loud from, like, our perspective. But in the ring, you can't hear a thing. And I was just like, ooh, God, like, yikes. That was kind of scary. So what's next for you? You go from here and you go where? Right um, back to do tough enough. We are flying back to do tough. So everyone's like pr pretty much angry with me right now because they're waiting for me so we can jump on the old jet ski and go on the on the old dusty dusty trail back to Orlando. But yeah, so they're probably all watching this like, will you hurry? <laughs> uh, the what? Uh, the, you get a, a story about Big Show. Oh yeah, on the you, jet. You got it. You got to tell that before. We're about to go off the air, but you got to tell that that story. Okay, so me and Renee Young were like, this is actually like two weeks ago. We're we're cold, and um, we we were like, oh, we're gonna find the blankets. And pictures like, no, I got a spare pair of pants like that. And he like throws these pair of trousers at us. So me and Renee decided we wanted to be a sweatpant mermaid. And we both got in like the leg each, and then we hopped, and then they put on some like country music, and then we like danced for everyone on thing. We also started a dance party last week, which is really cool. I started getting the old Tina Turner moves out because I was wearing tassels. No and big deal. At 23, you know who Tina Turner is. Yeah, my dad brought me up in a good way. His first ring music was simply the best. There you go. And then he changed it to Beastie, Bo Beastie Boys, Fight for Your Right. But I got brought up really good on music, I'm not gonna lie to you. Mm -hmm. All right, we're about to go home. Uh, what can we expect to see on Tough Enough tomorrow night? I literally have no idea now. Now we've got the Miz on there, it's like, he, it, it changes. But yeah, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I'm going to see how Amanda did this week. Yep. You know, I'm going to see how Sarah did. You know, but, right. you know, I'm going to go there all guns blazing because I'm furious that what happened last week. But Guns yeah. blazing, we're going to see what happens on Tough Enough as tomorrow night is live TV, and I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, from San Jose, California, I'm sitting there with Paige, two-time. WWE Diva Champion. My name is Stone Cold Steve Austin. Riding off from the sunset. I'll catch you down the road. Thank you very much, Paige. Yay! Thank you. <laughs>